Jesus is about to be betrayed, not by one disciple, but four, and maybe even more. Who are they, and why do they do it? Well, as Mark begins to conclude his gospel, promises and prophecies begin to unfold. We enter into the final moments of Jesus' life and ministry and observe some of the most important events in all of Scripture. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to show you what all of these moments mean and how they change the way you read Mark 14. So grab your Bible and your notebook, and let's dive into another episode of Beyond the Words. As we transition from Mark 13 to Mark 14, we find ourselves in a place where Jesus has just spent a lot of time describing some very apocalyptic imagery concerning the challenges that his disciples and future followers will face. Now, we are about to see some of those descriptions come true. And the setting for all of this is the transition between two very important religious holidays. Mark opens this chapter by telling us that the Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread are only two days away. Now, what I didn't realize for a long time is that these are actually two separate religious festivals. Passover was the holy day remembering the last of the ten plagues in Exodus, in which God passed over the homes of the Israelite people who had blood upon their door frames, while taking the firstborn sons of the Egyptians, including the Pharaoh. It was this moment that forced Pharaoh's hand and caused him to free the Israelite people from slavery. The festival of unleavened bread, however, was different. This was the celebration of how the Israelite people prepared for their freedom. God told them not to put any yeast in their bread as they departed Egypt. And there is some important imagery here that we will talk about later. What's important for us to know at this point in the story, though, is that the events unfolding are about to happen at the transition between these two religious festivals. And this actually helps us to imagine the overall setting as the events of this chapter take place. This tells us that Israel, Jerusalem specifically, was packed. Passover was one of the three religious festivals alongside Sukkot and Shavuot, in which every Jewish person was required to travel to the temple in Jerusalem to worship. This means that there would have been tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people in the city. Jesus' friends and family from Galilee would have certainly been there. And this explains something that Mark says very early on in this chapter. Mark mentions that the chief priests and the teachers of the law are trying to figure out a way to arrest and kill Jesus. Now, this isn't really a surprise to us. Right? They've been doing this for most of Mark's gospel. But what's interesting at this point is that Mark says that they are worried about how to do this now because people might riot. Now, there may be a lot of people in Jerusalem who believe in Jesus. I mean, just a few chapters ago, he rode in as a king on Palm Sunday. But this is also a reference to the crowds from Galilee. Jesus has spent most of his ministry reaching people in Galilee. And now all of those people are in Jerusalem. So Mark is setting up the tension here, right? Creating a problem that has to be solved. The religious leaders want to kill Jesus. They just don't know how. Jesus has too many followers, so they need a more covert way to do this. And the rest of this chapter is going to explain that, incorporating several of Jesus' own disciples into this scenario. But first... Mark has another event that he needs to tell us about. You see, one of the things that Mark does throughout his gospel is identify opposing groups, right? In many chapters, we see those who accept Jesus and those who reject him, those who believe in Jesus and those who don't yet have faith. Well, as we've said, this chapter is filled with people who resist and betray Jesus. But first, Mark wants us to see someone who truly believes. Mark tells us that Jesus is in the town of Bethany, at the home of a man named Simon the leper. Now, there's a strong chance that this name means that Simon used to be a leper, because leprosy was an incredibly isolating disease. Tradition stated that a person could not be within four cubits of someone with leprosy if they were downwind, which is about six feet away. And they couldn't be within a hundred cubits if they were upwind. 
Now, when we talk about leprosy, we're actually talking of a variety of skin conditions outlined in Leviticus 13. It could be anything from eczema to Hansen's disease, which is what we think of when we typically think of leprosy today. But what really matters is the consequences of these conditions. These diseases made you ritually unclean and forced you to be separated from the rest of society. When we meet this man named Simon the leper, most likely we are meeting a man who had leprosy for most of his life, hence his name, but was perhaps healed even by Jesus. Because it's not likely that Jesus, his disciples, and any of these other people present in this moment would have dined with a man who currently had leprosy. They all would have been at risk of acquiring this disease themselves, which would have been unthinkable. Nevertheless, the main character in this moment isn't actually Simon himself. It's an unnamed woman. You see, social customs of the time suggest that this woman must have been part of Simon's household to be present in this moment. And Simon must be a wealthy man because the woman approaches Jesus with a jar of perfume worth more than a year's wages. And just to imagine how expensive this was, imagine this being perfume worth $30,000, maybe much more than that today. And the woman then breaks the perfume jar and pours it on Jesus' head. The disciples are incredulous. I mean, they feel like this is such a waste, but look at how Jesus interprets it. He says that she is preparing him for burial. Now, to many of us, this scene seems rather confusing in the moment, but that's because Mark is using it to point towards things that will happen later. Not only is this woman preparing Jesus for burial before he has even died, she's also showing an act of faithfulness that will be held in stark contrast to the future behavior of Jesus' own disciples. This woman is willing to give everything for Jesus. Not even a perfume of this value, something that most would covet and kill for, is too much to sacrifice for her Savior. She is the image of fidelity and devotion. And she is the opposite of the disciples, specifically the one that Mark mentions next. Because while this woman sacrificed a year's wages to anoint Jesus, Judas leaves this meeting to go betray Jesus for an undefined sum. At least Mark doesn't define it. And all of a sudden, some pieces begin to fall into place. In verse 1, Mark introduces the problem of how the religious leaders will be able to kill Jesus. Well, in verse 10, he solves it. Judas will betray Jesus. But here's the problem with how many of us view this situation. We've heard about this so often, we've known about Judas's actions for so long, that this moment actually loses its impact. Right? It's like when you're re-watching a movie that has a huge plot twist. Once you know what's coming, you don't really feel the shock of that anymore. And that's how most of us feel about Judas's betrayal of Jesus. It's no longer shocking. But that's not how we're supposed to feel. And that's definitely not how people hearing this story for the first time would have felt. What Judas did was unthinkable. The relationship between a rabbi and a disciple was closer than that of a father and a son. There were sayings at that time that said things like, your father brought you into this world, but your rabbi brings you into the life of the world to come. And if a man's father and his rabbi are both taken captive, a disciple should ransom his rabbi first. I mean, this explains why Peter said that he left everything to follow Jesus. And why later in this chapter, he insists that he will die for Jesus. This is how devoted a disciple was to his rabbi, which makes Judas's betrayal that much worse. In Mark 13, 31 to 35, Jesus redefined his followers as a family supporting one another. So when Judas decides to betray Jesus, it reminds us of Mark 13, 12, where Jesus talks about being betrayed by family. Jesus promises about the trials that his followers will face are coming true, and he's going to be the first one to feel that pain. But here's the really amazing thing. Jesus embraces this pain. He doesn't run away from it. He uses what others meant for evil to glorify God and save us. You see, right after Mark tells us that Judas betrays Jesus, he narrates the last supper that Jesus has with his disciples. 
And as he begins this story, he returns to the details that he gave us at the beginning of this chapter. This Last Supper is happening at the transition point between Passover and the Festival of the Unleavened Bread. You see, the Passover lamb is sacrificed on the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. However, even though it is sacrificed on the 14th, it isn't eaten until after sunset. And since sunset marks the beginning of a new day in Jewish culture, the lamb was actually consumed on the 15th day of Nisan, which was the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Now, while those might seem like confusing details, they actually really matter when we're trying to understand everything happening at this Last Supper. The details of these meals tell us something about Jesus and reveal to us the meaning of some key moments that are about to unfold. Before that though, please take a moment to click the thumbs up and the subscribe buttons if you haven't done so already. If this is your first time on this channel or if you've been with us for a while, subscribing is a great way to catch all of our videos and help us to reach even more people. Our goal is to help people understand the Bible like never before and see it with an entirely new set of eyes. And by subscribing, you help us to do that. So thank you so much for your help. And now let's get back to the video. Okay, so as Jesus sits down to have this last supper with his disciples, Mark really wants us to pay attention to the details and the significance of these overlapping festivals. First, let's talk about Passover. At Passover, a very specific type of lamb was sacrificed. It was unblemished. It had no marks or injuries. This lamb represented the lambs the people sacrificed on the original Passover, whose blood they posted on their doorposts, whose sacrifice ultimately led to their freedom. Well, Jesus will be this type of sacrifice. He is the unblemished lamb who will free the people from their slavery to sin. And this is confirmed through the meaning and significance of the festival of unleavened bread. You see, at Jesus' last supper with his disciples, things look very different than we tend to imagine them. Take Da Vinci's Last Supper painting, for example. The disciples weren't actually lined up at a long table. Instead, they would have been reclining on the floor. And the bread that they were eating wouldn't have been typical loaves. It would have been unleavened bread. The festival of unleavened bread required that all leaven, in other words, all yeast, be removed from homes. Jesus and his disciples would have been eating flat, matzah-like bread. And, and here's why this matters so much. Leaven represented decay. Jewish people believed that it was the yeast in the bread that allowed it to spoil and go bad. So leaven came to represent those things that allowed God's people to spoil and go bad. Leaven represented sin and those things that separated the Israelite people from God. So when Jesus holds up the bread and says, this is my body, he's saying something about his body. He is unblemished. He is unleavened. He is without sin. In other words, Jesus is proclaiming that he is the perfect sinless offering for the people. But not only that, he's also making a promise about what will happen after he dies. That which has no leaven does not decay and neither will Jesus' body. He may die, but he will not decay. It's what he promised to his disciples already, right? The Son of Man will die, but he will also rise again. What others intend for evil, God will use for good. But then as soon as this happens, the pendulum swings back again. There's this pattern in Mark where we go back and forth between the faithful and the unfaithful. First, it was the religious leaders who want to kill Jesus. Then it was the faithful woman with the perfume. Then it was Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. And then it was Jesus' faithfulness to his mission. Well, now we're about to swing back and forth again. Because as Mark continues, we see more disciples betray Jesus as Jesus himself proves his fidelity to what he is here to do. When Jesus and the disciples leave the Last Supper, they immediately head to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is a tranquil olive grove just outside of the Jerusalem city. And when they arrive, Jesus asks three of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, to accompany him as he prays. But, but look at how he says this. He says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. In other words, 
Jesus is in pain. We get this powerful glimpse into Jesus' humanity. Jesus is fully God and fully human, and we see it right here. Jesus is overwhelmed by the task before him, and he's trusting these three disciples to be there for him in this moment. But they aren't. While Jesus ultimately remains faithful to his task and says, Not my will be done, but yours, Father. His disciples don't. They fall asleep. He's faithful and they aren't. He trusted Peter, James, and John to be there for him in this moment. But once again, his disciples have betrayed him. They've broken his trust. And immediately after this, the pattern repeats again. Once Jesus has finished praying, he says that the time has come. Judas and the guards approach. And when Judas approaches, he again does the unthinkable. Judas kisses Jesus. And at that time, a kiss represented affection and respect. In other words, this is a profound slap in the face. Over the past several verses, Judas has broken every social convention when it comes to friendship. He's dined with Jesus He's kissed him. He's called him rabbi. And now he betrays him. But Judas isn't the only one. While Mark tells us that one person draws a sword and attempts to fight for Jesus, he also says everyone else deserted him and fled. In one chapter, Jesus has been betrayed by every one of his disciples. Those who promised to be faithful to him to the end, those who promised to die for him, have left him in this moment of greatest need. But it's not over yet. After Jesus is arrested, we're often told that Jesus is put on trial before the Sanhedrin. But the truth is, there really is no trial. Everything about this scene tells us that the things happening here are definitely not official and not above board. Remember how we said that the religious leaders were looking for a way to kill Jesus? Well, the truth is the religious leaders had no power to kill Jesus. The Sanhedrin, who were the ruling Jewish court, they weren't allowed to decide matters of life and death. And that's because Judea is under Roman rule. Rome controls the death penalty. Even Herod the Great had to get permission from the emperor to execute his sons for treason. But there's more. Right? Since Jesus has been identified as the son of David, there are public claims that he is a king. And trials involving alleged kingship had to go before Roman officials. This shows us that the trial in these verses is not actually a trial at all. Instead, the religious leaders are using this as an opportunity to gather evidence against Jesus so that they can take him to Pilate and Pilate can execute him. I mean, this explains things, why these events happen in the middle of the night, why this trial continues even though witnesses disagree, something that according to Deuteronomy would have dismissed all of their testimony. They're just looking for a way to take him to the one who can do what they've been wanting to do all along, someone who can put an end to this false prophet who breaks the Sabbath and claims to be God. And ultimately, they get it. Jesus knows full well the impact of the words he's about to say, but he says them anyways. Jesus answers their question of, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one, by saying, I am. The same words that God spoke to Moses when Moses asked what God's name was. Words that everyone knew meant that Jesus himself was claiming to be God. And then he takes it a step further calling himself the son of man, which is this promise that he's the messianic figure who will free the people. And with this, the religious leaders have all that they need. A man who calls himself God when Rome claims that the emperor is God. A man who claims to be the Messiah who will free the people when Rome is hunting down those who are trying to incite rebellion. Jesus' fate is almost certain. This man will no longer be a problem for them. But here's what's so ironic about this moment. These are his people. For centuries, the Jewish people have been resisting oppressors who've come in and claimed their land. As a people, they've been harmed by one nation after another after another. They're supposed to be standing together. And yet, when God actually sends someone to save and free them, they betray him. Just like Judas did, 
just like Peter, James, and John did, just like the 12 did, and just like Peter will, as this chapter concludes and he denies even knowing Jesus. Time after time after time, Jesus is betrayed. No matter how faithful he remains, few end up being faithful to him. That's the message of Mark 14. Outsiders, people like the woman in Simon's house, they might be faithful to Jesus, but Jesus' closest disciples, his chosen 12, the leaders of God's people, all of these will betray him. It's not just Judas, it's everyone. And it's in a moment like this that Mark invites us all to ask some very difficult questions. Mark's audience, people persecuted for their faith in the first century, they're wondering, will I remain faithful to Jesus when things get difficult for me? And for those of us living today, we're faced with the same question. The people who betray Jesus in this chapter, they betray him out of fear. They betray him when they think that association with him will cost them. They betray him when they think that their ideas and their ways are better than his. And I'll be honest, right? I'm often tempted to do the same thing. I'm, I'm tempted to go my own way when the way of Jesus seems a little bit too hard. Or, or if it's going to cost me things that I hold dear. Or if it doesn't match what I want to do or what I think is best. I mean, do you ever go through that? Have you ever had a moment when you hid your relationship with Jesus because you knew it might be awkward? Because it might cost you some friends or a promotion or, or maybe even your life. Have you tossed out Jesus' teachings or other parts of Scripture because they didn't match your beliefs, right? Or they got in the way of what you wanted in life. I mean, every day, we're placed in chapter 14 of Mark's gospel. Will we be faithful? Will we be like the woman who gave everything out of devotion to Jesus? Or like the rest, will we fall away, little by little, one after another? I know that for some of you, this is a very real problem that you're wrestling with right now. And and I want to pray for your faith, right? That God will help you to stay faithful. Now, after this prayer, I'm going to give you a link to another video that will open your eyes to some amazing things happening in Mark's gospel. But for right now, let me pray for you. Oh, Jesus, our hearts break when we read this chapter. To see how faithful you were and then to see how alone you were. To imagine the pain that you felt as one person after another walked away from you, betrayed your trust. Lord, help us never to do that. You know our temptations, you know our selfish thoughts. But help us, Lord, to be like the woman with the perfume, to hold nothing back. Help us to be faithful to you despite our desires, despite what other people think, despite what it may cost us. Because we believe, Jesus, that you are the Messiah. You are worthy of our worship, and it is in you that we will find our true salvation. For you are the perfect lamb, the one who will never decay, our Lord and our Savior, and it is in you that we pray. Amen. Okay, now before you go, click this link right here that will take you to another Beyond the Words video that will open your eyes to the amazing things you've never seen before in Mark's gospel. And until next time, have a great week and God bless.